to stand for the reading of the gospel, which is taken from the book of John, the 12th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold, the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. For grace and peace to you from God our Heavenly Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Well, God is something I would like for you to, to do today, speaking of churches that do stuff, that roll with the flow. Um, I'm going to ask you to participate in a little kind of a, uh, it's not really hypnotism. <laughs> but here's what I want you to do. I want you to all close your eyes for just a minute. Everybody close your eyes. Now, what I want you to do is I want you to reach back into the recesses of your memory, and I want you to remember back when you were just a kid. And I want you to think back, I want you to visualize in your mind the church that you grew up in. I want you to take yourself back, remember and try to visualize what it looked like. Now many of you may be picturing this very church. So walk yourself through the church. Pick out all the things you remember. If you're like me, you remember every little nook and cranny. Because as a child, I played in every nook and cranny of my church. And now that you have that visual, I want you to turn on your sense of hearing and try to recall all the sounds that your church made. Do you remember? Maybe you recall the sound of the organ or the piano that was unique to your church. Maybe you remember how the sounds, the doors made, the front doors, the side doors. How about the noises of the heating and cooling system? How about all the unique sounds that you hear while playing in the church or just sitting quietly? Maybe it made noises that you could never identify. Now I want you to switch over to recalling all the things that you touched in your church. How did your pews feel? How did your feet feel? Was there tile or carpet beneath your feet or both? How about the door handles, the altar railings, the communion cups? How about the walls, the chairs? Were they metal? Were they wooden? How many things can you remember touching? And now switch over to your sense of taste. Now this is going to be a little bit more challenging, but what do you remember about the taste of your church? Now I'm not suggesting that any of you lick the pews or eat the flowers. But do, you, do you recall the taste of the casseroles at the potlucks that you went to way back in the day? Do you remember the bread and the kind of bread and wine that you used? And now switch over to your sense of smell. 
Is there a sense of smell that you can associate with your church? I know for me that we had a, an annual sauerkraut supper, so whenever I smell sauerkraut, it reminds me, takes me back to my church. How about the sense of smell here at St. Paul? I bet you've never been asked that question. But if your church or this church had a smell, how would you describe it? Was it sweet? Was it old? Was it musty? Was it fragrant? What was that smell? Okay, you can open your eyes. Did you enjoy that trip down memory lane? Now you're probably asking yourself, why is he making me do this? This is kind of weird. Why would anybody be interested in how I used my sense of sight and sound and touch, taste and smell to experience church? Well, when we usually think of the God of the Bible, we get a picture in our mind of a God who is watching over us. We certainly can get the sense through Scripture that God touches us. We hear God all the time through Scripture, sounds of creation, the sounds of humanity that God created. They are all around us. We can't escape them. I'm going to read to you Psalm 145, and I want you to see if you can pick out the senses that is used in this passage that indicates God's senses. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call to him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. Now, of course, the only sense that is missing in that psalm is a description of God's sense of smell. But really, do we ever stop to think that God might have a sense of smell? Now, have you ever, after church or between services or on the street, ever asked each other, hey, do you think God has a sense of smell? I don't think I've ever asked anybody that. Or maybe you've wondered, maybe just right now, is do you think God is smelling us right now? How do we smell? Is God smelling the person next to me? Have you smelt the person next to you? How do you smell? I hugged DJ this morning, and he smelled pretty good. <laughs> Told me he finally took a shower. <laughs> but the biblical evidence that a divine olfactory sense exists, I think, and I think it's pretty intriguing, and it can be found as early as in the book of Genesis. Following the flood, when Noah comes out of the ark, he sacrifices burnt offerings on an altar, and the first thing that God does is smell. In Genesis 8, the Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every, incl every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood, and never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. Indeed, humans, in humans, the olfactory system has a very strong overlapping neur neuronal connection with the amygdala and the hypothalamus. Those are brain areas that are critical to the processing of emotion and memory. Now, the sense of smell is also closely associated with early Jewish purity laws. The connection between olfaction 
and ancient Jewish concepts of purity may not be immediately obvious to our modern minds. And in many ways, our perception about what smells holy or unholy may be influenced by our cultural standards of what is clean or unclean. One useful way of understanding ancient Jewish purity laws is to think about clean and unclean. It's a line of demarcation between what is whole and what is orderly. A person who doesn't practice concepts of purity is therefore regarded as unholy and unclean, and they personify death, disease, and disorder. So in light of these purity laws, Martha's warning to Jesus in John 11 to not roll away the stone covering Lazarus' tomb is pretty understandable. Because in Martha's eyes, Jesus was taking a huge risk in uncovering a decaying corpse, lest they all become unclean from the very odor of putrefying flesh. But perhaps the sense of smell has never been so embraced in Scripture as in today's gospel. That moment six days before the Passover where Mary and Martha, the sisters of Lazarus, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, hosted a dinner in Jesus' honor to express gratitude for Lazarus' resurrection. In fact, Lazarus himself was present at this dinner. Mary pours out a lavish amount of nard, anoints Jesus' feet with it, and wipes them with her hair. By this extravagant act, Mary is essentially introducing Jesus to anyone who still doesn't know who he is. She, however, knows exactly who he is and the kind of honor he is due. Mary was never confused about who Jesus was, nor did she misread his mission. For Mary, Jesus deserves an act of extravagant holiness and points to what is to come by anointing him beforehand for burial because he is or will soon be the lamb slain, the crucified Messiah. Now the purpose of John's gospel is to show that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was Christ, the Son of God, and that believers in him might have eternal life. The perfume, the nard Mary uses, was a focus in this passage because the smell of the nard on Jesus' feet was to become that smell of new life. It celebrated new life in contrast to and in defense of Jesus' death and the finality of death itself. She carefully and reverently cleanses his feet because he is the Son of Man who came not to be served but to serve, who will soon perform the same service for his disciples. She lovingly bathes his feet amid the smell of perfume so that wonderfully sweet scent of the perfume will be associated with Jesus rather than the stench of the looming betrayal, jealousy, and violence that is to come. Her gratitude has compelled her to use the perfume in celebration of Jesus and the life he restored in Lazarus rather than as a ritual associated with death and burial. It is a sweet moment of stillness amid a gathering storm, an outpouring of homage amid the onslaught of hatred. This smell of perfume, this fragrance, says this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, the suffering, serving Son of Man, the Son of God who for a little while gave us the opportunity to sit at his feet. Mary, along with the scent of perfume, together say, I would like to cherish him for one bright, fragrant moment before the sewage of hatred and violence washes over him and carries him away. Mary does this so that moment is forever associated with that fragrance. Maybe Mary somehow knew that the human sense of smell 
is the most powerful of all the human senses. It is the same sense through which most of our powerful memories are triggered. Now, John's Gospel has Mary anointing Jesus' feet rather than his head, preserving a tradition similar to that in Luke's Gospel. But in the context of John's Gospel, the anointing of feet has a much different connotation than it does in Luke, where the sinful woman uses the act of forgiveness for her sins. In John's Gospel, Mary's anointing of Jesus' feet is a preview to another more famous foot washing, which Jesus carries out for his disciples. That foot washing, in turn, is followed by Jesus' most important commandment, according to John. Love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. In John's Gospel, Mary's anointing of Jesus enacts a series of radical acts of hospitality, extending from Mary to Jesus, then from Jesus to his disciples, and finally, in the commandment to love one another from his disciples back to the world. We should remember, however, that Jesus did not ask Mary to honor him in such an extravagant way, but he graciously receives the gift that she has offered of her own accord. Jesus accepts Mary's gift, not because he desires to be lavished with extravagance, but because it is her heartfelt expression of the profound gratitude that she feels at having received her brother back from the dead. Jesus himself takes up Mary's act of foot washing in his own actions towards his disciples in the following chapters because it seems that Mary's gift has had a particularly deep and profound impact on him. And while he does not wash the disciples' feet with expensive perfumes as she did, he does take the extravagant hospitality she offered to him and returns it to them with the further command that they should in turn extend it back to others, to anyone who is in need of welcome. By his death and resurrection, Jesus threw open the doors of heaven in the most extravagant act of hospitality ever imaginable, thus returning Mary's gift to us, multiplied beyond comprehension. As followers of Jesus, we live out of this extravagant act of hospitality and offer it to the poor, the oppressed, the disheartened, the downtrodden. This is the great commandment. This is the extravagance to which we are called. So to experience our faith at its most tangible, we need to use all our senses. And even though we have perhaps never associated our sense of smell with God or church or Jesus, the sense of smell can help us to recall or trigger our remembrance of the promises of God the promise of eternal life in Christ. The smells of our church, Christ's church, smells of new life. Mary's story offers us a powerful new way to associate and to recall the gift God bestowed to us through Christ. Our sense of smell begs us to, as the song says, wake up and smell the roses along the way. Or perhaps we should more accurately say, wake up and smell God in Christ along the way.